We're going to let the panel introduce themselves, and the first person to speak tonight is going to be Antonia Broyaka. Close. I, work, I practiced that for 20 minutes this afternoon, but go ahead. Hello, everyone. And I really appreciate that I've been invited here. Antonia, tell them where you're from. Sorry? Tell them where you're from. Yeah, I will. <laughs> I'm not from Kansas. I'm even not from America. I'm from Ukraine. And thank you. Those applause to all Ukrainian people who are very brave. And the reason why I came here, actually, uh, that was the war. Um, because I am, first of all, I'm mom. And I have two kids. And I wanted to protect them. So first of all, I really appreciate the all efforts that Kansas State University did. Um, because um, they invited me and they employed me. So now I'm with AggieCon. But my entire life I worked for Vinitsa National Agrarian University as an ag economist and I was dean of College of Economics and Entrepreneurship back in Ukraine. So I want to tell you just a few words about Ukraine and why it's so important now to all the agricultural world and food security. I'm pretty confident that not many people before the war started thought about Ukraine as a such important uh, player on an agricultural market, especially on a grain market. But actually, Ukraine is a literally breadbasket, not only for Europe, but for the entire world. And Ukraine can produce, and we actually fed, 400 million people per year. That's a lot. So Ukraine before the war was number one on a sunflower oil. Almost a half of all exports was from Ukraine uh, on sunflower meal. We were third on corn market and fifth on a wheat market. And when the war started, all this infrastructure, all agricultural uh, sector uh, with all our economy actually been destroyed. And just direct losses for our infrastructure, more than $140 billion. And that is just direct losses, including almost $9 billion to agriculture. Hundreds of thousand roads been destroyed, bridges, railroads, and this is everything influenced directly or indirectly to agricultural production, crop production, livestock production, especially destruction of our power system. A, a, a lot of uh, power enterprise been destroyed and there, if there is no electricity, there is no life, right? So Ukraine was the first country that had total blackout, unfortunately, and many enterprises stopped. Talk, talking about direct losses to agriculture, that is $6.6 .6 billion. That is just losses to facilities. And I just want to pay attention to those red letters. That is how much animals we lost. Nothing can be compared, of course, with human losses. We lost already 8 million, oh, sorry, 8,000 uh, civilians and 13,000 troops, but we also lost a lot of livestock. Uh, we lost 95,000 of sheep and goats and more than two, uh, 200,000 of uh, cattle and more, th more than half of a um, million of pigs and 11 million of poultry. And this is everything protein, right? That is everything food for people. And that is huge losses. But if you compare livestock losses with other losses in agriculture, that is not the biggest. It, that is just 1%. 44% that is agricultural machinery that has been stolen or destroyed by Russians. And this means that we will not be able to produce corn, to produce wheat, barley, which, uh, 
soybeans that would be a feed for animal, right, and for human. So, unfortunately, those dark regions, that is regions that occupied it or destroyed. And in terms of structure of our losses, indirect losses that destroyed our markets, again, livestock, it's not such a big losses, but we lost a lot of crop production. In terms of livestock, we lost our, the structure of our losses, like that is 31% of milk and uh, oh, we lost the microphone, no, sorry, 30% 30, 30 of pigs, but it's still a lot because that's food security to our country and also to other countries that were import dependent from our production grain production and livestock. So our loss is huge. And in terms of grain, we lost 37% of our production. In terms of oil seeds, we lost 24% of our production. In terms of meat, we lost 3 million tons of production. Milk, more than 7 million tons. So unfortunately, it leads to other problems with processing industry, with food security, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of poultry, that is not so bad because the period, you know, to replace chicken is much faster than to replace cow or pig. So um, some of, some of uh, producers increase their uh, production, but uh, it's hard now to replace our uh, uh, beef and pork production, unfortunately. So we will need a lot of investments, not only uh, money, but also technological support and uh, also um, some um, uh, seeds and maybe good quality buffaloes, uh, bulls, right, to rep for reproduction of our livestock. So what are the problems now why our livestock uh, do not operate as it should be, first of all, because we lost a lot of animals, and also it caused a decrease, uh, decrease in productivity. And also the supply chain was disrupted. It's both, like raw materials to feed animals, but also to ship um, final goods final products. And also difficulties to prepare hay and silage, right, because a lot of fields been destroyed with mines and shells, so it cannot be operated. We lost for now 22% of our arable land, and you know our land is not like here in Kansas. That is totally black and very deep top soil. Ukraine actually owns a sort of um, all black fertile soil in the world. So it's mean us very important in a, um, agricultural production uh, of different crops. So talking about crops, I just want to point you several numbers that we lost almost 30% of our crops. And the worst thing was with corn, actually in the entire history of Ukraine, th that was the first year when we finished harvesting corn in March. That would never happen. Usually that is November. But lack of fuel, lack of energy to dry corn, right? Because no electricity, no fuel, um, and different of the prices and difficulty with logistic force farmers just to left corn, to leave corn on the fields. And before the end of 2022, in December, we harvested only 20 million ton of corn. Last year, we harvested 42 million ton. So 20 million less. And till March, some farmers decided to harvest and we harvested seven more million tons, but it's still not a 42 like last year and we will not export right so much corn and so much wheat as we usually did so just 
quick look what we expect. So last year we produced 33 million ton of wheat. This year we produced 20 and next year, I mean 2023, right? This summer we expect that we have probably 14. So it will be enough for us, but it will be not enough for the world. In terms of corn, so even worse, right? So 42, 27, and maybe 16. It means that we will export maybe 11 million tons instead of 27 that we did last year. So in this very short speech, I just wanted to tell you that Ukraine is really important on a global food market and uh, the disruption of the logistic in Ukraine and disruption of our market hardly influence on uh, all prices and all the world, right? So that's why you kind of complain now that fuel is higher price and food is higher, but it's, believe me, not so hard as in Ukraine. So on the end, I just want to tell you one gallon of fuel now in Ukraine, 10 bucks. Don't complain. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you. Antonina. Uh, So, uh, for our audience, please tell us if, what you're doing at K-State. I believe you're on uh, and uh, working in, in the Ag Econ Department. Is that correct? And how yes. long will you be here? So, I arrived in March when the war started, and um, I hope I will stay here as long as possible, at least till the war would be over. And um, I don't know. It will depend. So are you teaching, doing research? I do. Okay. I do research on the impact of uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine on a global food security and grain market. I do teach uh, international agricultural de uh, development also and do some several projects now. And I do a lot of speeches because people just really know to, to really want to know the truth you know, from the first person about what is going on in Ukraine, because you are really limited in the information here. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing with us. You're welcome. Next uh, panel member who has slides, Dr. Neville Spear. Okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started and we'll pull these up, but when we sort of, we had a pre-seminar call a couple weeks ago, and um, I'm the old guy on the panel, by the way, experienced, yeah, so right, Dr. Sticka, he's shaking his head, yes, and so Dr. Tonzer brought up a great point that really we re need to remind ourselves, and much of what John talked about earlier is, is the historical perspective of what's happened in the beef industry. Because I think far too often, we forget about where we've come from. And so much of the story of the beef industry and the success that we've had in this business uh, really starts right here, right? Um, and I'm looking at one perfect example of that is US premium beef, okay? And then as you get this new uh, CAB painting on the side of the barn. That's another, you know, just brick in, in terms of telling the story of what's happened over time. And, and by the way, I just noticed the front of your catalog, right? Make beef better. Because at the end of the day, ultimately, I think we need to remind ourselves that we really, we are in a consumer business. We serve beef and we ultimately create or don't create happy customers. So with that, uh, we'll see if this is gonna... Yeah. Nope. Okay, so John talked about it just, you know, real quickly in terms of where, where, where have we come from? And the, and the best example of that anecdotally 
is just looking at kind of the research at National Beef Quality Audit. And again, I'm the old guy on the panel. I remember being at CSU and when we were right in the middle of doing the very first beef quality audit and getting up and going to a packing plant in Greeley in the mornings to help collect some of this data. And notice, right, I, don't, I think we all know this pretty well, but one of our biggest challenges was marbling and palatability and ultimately what's beef's advantage in the marketplace? It's supposed to be taste, right? That's ultimately why consumers are gonna be willing to pay more for our product versus the other. And so the very thing that we kind of supposedly hang our hat on, we were not doing very well at. So with that, this is a slide that I think we really need to remind ourselves of over and over and over again, right? Because any dollars that come into our business and money available for cattle ultimately come from the consumer. And between 1980 and 1998, pork and poultry garnered about $106 in new spending. The beef industry got six. So 106 versus six. Pork and poultry outpaced beef by $100 in new spending over 18 years. And those of you that were in the business in 1998, remember how awful that was in terms of a market, right? Okay. And if we don't have new dollars coming into the business, there's no new opportunities. And so often I hear all of these arguments and complaints in our business about how we want to get back to the old ways of doing business. That's where we're going. And there were no new opportunities during those 18 years. And by the way, remind yourself, those of you that are, have a little more age than others, right? What happened during the 80s? That was an inflationary period. And we couldn't grow spending even just due to the fact of inflation. We were way behind. So as we talk about consumers, Ultimately, at the end of the day, it really matters. And if you just put Fed prices against consumer spending, the correlation is about 0.85. And it's, a, it's pretty solid year after year. We outperformed in 14 and 15 because of supply. We underperformed in 20 and 21 due to COVID. These numbers... Dr. Tonser could tell us we're going to be updated here just about probably any day from LMIC in terms of annual spending, and we'll be right along those very lines. And so ultimately, that's our story. More dollars mean better prices. And that's what ultimately we have to keep reminding ourselves and then where we came from as, as we talk about this. And I think the other thing, too, that we often forget in all of this, right? It, it all flows back calf prices too, right? And again, 1980, 1998, calf prices were flat. Prices have gotten better and we're seeing that pick up even further from now. And we just came through a year of incredible beef production. We did 28.2 billion pounds with near record prices. You know, we talk a lot about the record prices in 14. We only did 23 billion pounds. Huge difference. That's a shift in demand. So that's really an incredible story. And last but not least, let's not forget our international partners. And it frustrates me when I hear all this chatter about let's stop with international trade and trade's not good. The beef industry is benefiting more from international trade than any other sector in the economy. You know, we just did almost a record of $12 billion. And so these things really do matter to our business. And we just, my point being is we need to keep focused on, right, who's, who's the end goal and it's the consumer both domestically and internationally. And speaking to that, Neville, the um, success story that you've just described, a lot of that is due to the people in this room. No that, question. This that, is the that foundation. Are using the genetics, like Gardner Genetics and, and others. So, so, so to that very point, in fact, so I have my wife, Sandra, with me. 
and um, tonight, and, and uh, we were in graduate school together, and one of the things that I remember very well is one year Larry Cora was a visiting professor. He was on sabbatical, came to Colorado State, and we were just talking about, we remember well being in a class, and he showed a video, I believe from the BIF Commercial Producer of the Year Award. We remember that like it was yesterday. And the foundations, yes, started here way back when. So, yeah. Thank you, terrific. Dr. Glenn Tonzer, Kansas State University. Thank you, Greg. Uh, you guys will all be disappointed to know I did not bring 50 PowerPoint slides. I don't think John brought any either, so we're probably done with the slides. You're getting a mix of some with and without. Um, I want to make just two main points and touch on both presenters before me. Um, the first one is a lot broader than just being in the beef cattle industry. So you guys have all heard the phrase, you know, you can look at the same half glass, and this is more than half empty now, but you can look at a glass that's half full and say it's half full or you can say it's half empty. I'm a pretty proud and admittedly spoiled American, but I encourage everybody in the room to recognize how good you have it. And a personal challenge would be is for us all to try to continue, right, to pass that forward. There's plenty of things that can be improved in America. I'm not naive to that. I have my own wish list and complaint list, of course. Um, as a father of three, I think through those things from you know, future generations. But we do have it pretty good. So first broad comment to piggyback on, and that's broader than just the Ukraine situation. That just allows me to make that comment tonight. And bringing it back to beef and cattle, one of the reasons that this industry has it better is because the US beef cattle industry is truly the global leader in grain finished high quality beef. And please note, I added in the grain finished high quality component. I would discourage the US beef cattle industry from trying to be the cheapest producer of beef. And I would certainly discourage the US beef cattle industry from trying to be the cheapest meat. The odds of being a cheaper offering of meat protein than poultry and pork are quite low. And the odds of beating other systems around the world in the cost of producing beef, if we don't differentiate beef, frankly, are pretty low as well. So the comparative advantage in the U.S. is grain-finished, high-quality beef. And that fits not just tonight. I mean, that's my mantra all the time. I'm not just saying it because of where I'm sitting right now, but it goes in spades for why we're here at the moment. Um, it also leads to, we may well have beef be a much higher price relative to pork and chicken going forward, not just because of cost of production differences, and those exist, and I've belabored them in other settings, but if demand is truly outpacing the other proteins, this geeky economist would tell you we expect to see that. So consumers paying higher prices sometimes gets talked about as a bad thing because beef's too expensive. If the only reason consumers have higher prices is because there's been su supply shocks and we're just passing on higher cost, there's inefficiencies, those kind of things, then I agree there's room for improvement and over time we'd see prices come back. But if prices are higher because consumers value the item more, that is truly a win-win. It's a win because somebody voluntarily paid more for a product they want more, and it's a win for the industry because that's $2 instead of $1, or three instead of two, or whatever, right? The economic pie in the industry is growing. So that's all I'm going to share until we have more comments, um, and I'm happy to respond further. But please take note. We have it good. Do your part to make the world better. I think we all can do that. That's broader than the beef cattle space. But then also recognize the collective comparative advantage of the industry truly is in the grain-finished, high-quality beef space. Glenn, to your point, uh, one question before we move on. Um, the recent power of meat study being one thing and, and, and the recent uh, uh, prices of uh, beef that we're seeing. So we know inflation has impacted our consumers, but that doesn't necessarily look like it's having a huge impact on beef demand. Would you say that's true? Um, most in this room know that there's multiple ways to measure beef demand, and I'm the confusing guy that does it three different ways. Um, Two of the three measures I have say beef demand domestically has slipped since Labor Day. And I personally don't think that's a product quality issue. 
I think it's a consumer finance issue. So I'm 42, so I am one of the younger ones on the panel to peg mark this. Uh, anybody my age and younger before last summer had not lived through 8% inflation. This is a general statement. And there was some time bought with personal savings and government allocations and so forth to where that didn't hit the household wallet immediately. But by the time 2022 was concluding, many U.S. households were facing the reality of elevated inflation outpacing their, you know, their wages. So they're falling behind on the net pay. Please follow me on that. Is that anything specific about beef? So many categories have had a demand decline since roughly Labor Day as consumers have tightened their financial belt. Um, the reason I m walk us through that is nobody in this room can influence inflation in the U.S., right, or average earnings or whatever. Most of those things are beyond the, you know, influence of this industry. You can control your product quality so that when they're able to afford it, they're able and willing to pay up. And I think that's been the experience until recent months. And that's what you do in the long term. And when it comes to genetics, that's a long term play anyhow, right? So long term beef demand has been good domestically and abroad to tee this up for John. Uh, the three legged stool, domestic retail, domestic food service and export all have good stories to be told. And the more high quality beef we produce, the better we can find optimal markets in each of those three for different cuts, which frankly mitigates some of the inflation issues because if you improve the quality, you can get better products in front of people that are less price sensitive. So I know that's a long answer, but please note beef demand has slipped in the last few months, um, but I don't think it's because of a quality concern. Okay, well that uh, transitions us into the expert on beef quality, and that's John Sticka from the Certified Angus Beef. Well, thank you very much. I guess, first off, I, I was, when you said how old you, I thought we were a little closer in age, but I definitely am part of team experience, I think, so. I've always looked old. Okay, no, no. The, uh, no, when Mark asked if I would, if I would join the panel, I, I really was curious to know kind of what the overall discussion was and, and where kind of our experience and the observations that I have fit into this. And I really appreciate the, the perspective that's been shared. And if I were to summarize maybe in my mind, what, what this panel is and why it's relevant to, to you is, is it's think globally, but act locally. We hear that referred to if we want to change the world, think globally, but start in your own community. And as I think about the, 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 the situation that you shared about how global dynamics and, and uh, um, uh, activities affect global markets, Okay, they can affect them negatively, but they also can affect them positively in, in many, many ways. And we try to, we can't be uh, maybe blind to those bigger scale, bigger economic drivers in our, in our industry that ultimately impact each and every one of us. But at the end of the day, how do we respond to those in their totality? Not in terms of one situation versus the other, but in their totality, how do we take all that in and then make decisions that impact our profitability at, at farm and ranching level? And so I've been at Certified Angus Beef 24 years. This is the only place I've ever was gainfully employed. And I've been able to see a lot of different things over that period of time. And one of them that has been the most exciting has been what's been shared already. The, not just the domestic growth and demand for high quality beef, but the global demand that we see for certified Angus beef and other products. This, this quality train is headed down a track and there's really nothing that's gonna stop it. The question I think will be is how can we continue to produce enough quality for a globe that looks to the U.S. for the source of high quality beef. I, I couldn't uh, agree more with what Glenn shared. We had a large customer tell us, this would have been probably 15 years ago, as he was addressing some of, uh, some of our partners at an event and um, uh, with one of the largest food service distributors in the world, and he said, if you want to try to produce select product, just know I can buy it cheaper. I can buy an equivalent cheaper in Brazil than I can buy it from those of us right here. And so we know that our market is much bigger than just the domestic market. From a certified Angus beef standpoint, we've learned a lot about, about the markets as a whole and, and places to sell our product. For some of you, just maybe as a, a frame of reference, uh, pre-COVID, well, actually, we were celebrating 13 consecutive years of record sales in a row halted only by COVID. If that tells you anything about the growth in demand, not just here domestically, but around the world, um, you think about that time period, that includes, right, that started right after BSE, okay, in 2004-ish, okay, but then we moved into the, the worst global recession that we've seen, 2008, 
And it was a period of time where everybody told us around the world, everybody was going to trade down. And, and don't get me wrong, price very much becomes an issue, but I want to drive home this point. Price in relation to value is ultimately what consumers place, uh, what we believe they place their emphasis on whether they buy our product or not. Now, in some cases, I'm sure we're priced out of the pocketbook of some consumers, but many consumers around the world, beef and a great eating experience is an affordable luxury that they aren't going to give up easily. And that's what we continue to see. From the standpoint of our sales this last year, we sold 1.234 billion pounds, the second best year in our entire history. And uh, about, a four, about 45 percent of that is domestic retail. Another third is domestic food service. Another eight percent or seven, eight percent is uh, kind of domestic um, uh, refabrication, value added products and so forth. And then 15 to 16 percent is international markets international markets. And our top five would be Canada and Mexico. Uh, then you've got Japan and Hong Kong uh, and South Korea that are in there as well. And, and I share that because when, it look, when you look at where we're focused on where the market's going to be, we will obviously continue to grow our domestic market uh, each and every day. The majority of our, of our staff is focused on that. But we have a team member in Mexico. We have a team member in Canada and Montreal. We have a team member in Japan. We're looking to add another one. We just added a team member in South Korea, and we just added a team member in Hong Kong. And we're, by the end of the week, next week, we should have a team member hired in the Middle East. If that tells you a little bit about what we're seeing globally, uh, in spite of all the dynamics that we see in the economy from a, a big picture standpoint, there is still an opportunity for us to sell more product, both domestically and internationally, and we're ramping up for that. Um, I, I drive this point home because this brand continues to be a reflection not of subsidies, okay, from any government. It's, it's not a, a program that receives any special treatment in the marketplace other than the pure calling of demand and the ability for, for folks that are focused on quality to meet that demand of the consumer. Um, and to that point, we find ourselves to where we are from an Angus standpoint much different today than we were in 1978, like I mentioned earlier. And it's a function because the free market enterprise system has worked. Economic signals that are generated both internationally and, and domestically have shared those signals clear back through the production chain through the form of grid premiums and other economic signals that have indicated that a high quality carcass oriented Angus bull is worth in one of another breed. And today, if you look at where we're at today, certified Angus beef carcasses on a headcount basis make up 22% of the entire fed cattle industry. 22% of all carcasses, fed steer and heifer carcasses, go into certified Angus beef today. And I would tell you there's not enough. That's still not enough for where we see the demand continuing to grow. I agree with everything that was shared, uh, and I love it when an uh, um, uh, economist doesn't have slides. It still doesn't make it fair, but it makes it better for me, okay? Okay, without the data, okay? But what I would tell you is that uh, March of, uh, of 2022, last March, was the best month for sales in the history of our program, okay? This March, as we finish it up uh, here today, um, it, it very easily will be the second best month in the history of our program, if not the best, okay? And so what I tell you again is consumers, we do see them trading down, maybe not quite as many strips, maybe a few more sirloins, maybe a, a lot more ground beef, other items, but we do have to sell that entire carcass and the premiums that grids reflect are driven by total carcass value, not just the value placed on the rib strip and tenderloin uh, and ribeye like we tend to think, I think as producers sometimes. It's selling um, flat meat and, and fajita steaks and all these different cuts that used to go into ground beef. Those are all out there driving demand, and that's a demand that's being driven by consumers globally, not just consumers right here domestically. And so we're very confident tough times in the economy are tough for everybody, but they're a lot harder for those focused on commodity beef production than they are focused on quality beef production and what consumers are really asking for. John, I have a follow-up uh, follow question for you. Uh, and, and for everybody in the room, I have been to the Certified Angus Beef Annual Convention uh, multiple times. It's not a cowboy convention, if you will. It is uh, restaurateurs, uh, entrepreneurs. It is um, food service 
re uh, the retail chains. There's the big boys, Cisco's and the Kroger's and the, the little guys, the family restaurants. And, and the family restaurants and the mom and pop, those are the ones I'm interested in right now. So we know that you just mentioned your demand or sales um, is, is high, running high for March. What about mom and pop restaurants? Have they uh, recovered from COVID now? Yeah, I think they really have. You know, actually a lot of restaurants right now are, are seeing record sales. I mean, their sales dollars are way up. Now the challenging part is sales dollars don't always equate to record margins. Okay, but it's not an issue with consumers coming in. Our food service business is, is up already this year. Uh, we're expected to have a record year in food service. Uh, and what we're finding is that it still comes down to a to labor issue. Okay, but uh, I've, never, I've not seen this kind of optimism coming out of this kind of tragedy that we saw at food service during COVID in a long, long time. Those folks that survived that, that uh, experience are stronger today than they were before. They've learned more about how to manage their help and their labor, how to balance uh, the work hours and hours that they're open. Some restaurants that used to be open five days a week or six days a week are now open five uh, just to uh, make sure that they're keeping the staff that are willing to come to work. But they've also increased their prices. You know, our goal with Certified Angus Beef is not only for, we want everybody who touches this brand to make as much money as they possibly can. From the end user, clear to obviously the registered Angus breeders that, that own us. And I would tell you that demand at that level is, is, uh, is, is strong, you know, it's strong. Our, our retail business is down, okay, to, to your point. And what we've seen in particular uh, from our experience has been retailers making the, the decision for the consumer that price has exceeded value. I don't always know if the consumer that buys our products says that the price has exceeded value, but I know the retailer can't make the projected margin at the prices that we're seeing, and sometimes that retailer makes that decision for their business, not necessarily because the consumer told them to, and uh, uh, I think that's a little bit what we're seeing from our retail standpoint today, but, but our, our international business is uh, growing about 5 to 6% as well. What I read into what you just said is there's probably very few, if any, of those small restaurants that quit using certified Angus beef because of the pandemic. Would that be true? Absolutely. Actually, I would tell you that um, it's one thing to ask somebody to pay more, but if you're going to ask them to pay more, you better offer them more. And I would tell you that for those that survived the pandemic, they doubled down on quality because they had to raise their price points, uh, their menu prices, consumers expected more. And, and I would tell you that the restaurateurs that are on our brand are more committed to quality than they were even before the pandemic. Okay. Uh, Debbie, tell me who has the microphones back here. We're going to open it up for questions. This is your opportunity to, to grill these people that are on the stage. Okay. A question here. Wait, wait on the microphone, please. I have two questions. One for the young lady from Yugoslavia. Tell, tell us what state you're from. You don't have to tell us your name if you don't want to, but at least tell us where you're from. Brad Rayo from Kansas. Three hours from here. Okay. Very good. Um, what is your government doing to financially help farmers and ranchers in that country? Because, as you said, uh, grain production is down 24 to 30 percent. They're probably not being able to sell as much. They're probably going to be, you know, financially hurt. Do you know what programs the Ukrainian government is doing to help shore that up so that long term you have a sustainable agriculture? Yes, uh, our government tried to do our best what they can. Unfortunately, the main uh, part of our budget goes to the war, right? Because we need to defend our land. But there are some programs, and also there is uh, a support from USAID. There is a big uh, program called Agri-Ukraine. Uh, uh, that is a $100 million program, but believe me, it's still not enough. To rebuild Ukrainian economy, we need for now $750 billion. So that's still not enough. But 
due to this program and some other programs, FAO programs and others, and also some government support, our farmers um, had some credits, like 0% credits. They had some um, compensation per head they lost of the animals, which is not a huge amount, like could be like $100 per cow, but it's still at least something. Um, we also got some plastic bags because we lost almost 13 million, um, 13, uh, mil 13 million tons of uh, storage capacities. So we needed to storage our grain, but this is just short term, you know, is, uh, so solution. We need another storages for next years. So I would say that our government tried to do as much as it possible due to the budget that they have, but the highest part of this budget, the biggest one, goes to the war, unfortunately, and it is still not enough to win the war. Thank, Thank you. you. John, I have one for you. Uh, certified Angus beef has specifications that we must meet. As breeders, we continue to try to increase, you know, we're, we're chasing the prime market now, not choice. Is, are, are you planning to increase specifications so that certified Angus beef is keeping up with the trend of, uh, the, you know, the, the amount of prime and high choice carcasses that we're producing? Now we are, okay. The, um, uh, great question. The, uh, from the standpoint of eating quality, I would say we're not looking to increase, to make it more difficult for, for cattlemen to hit the, the, the upper two thirds choice mark for certified Angus beef. And the reason I say that is because while the market produces more of it, we still know what hasn't changed is that still produces the kind of eating quality that consumers expect around the world for, for high quality certified Angus beef. What I will tell you is that while here we sit in a tight supply, we've added, back in 2004, we added certified Angus beef prime. Today, that's about a 35 million pound program out of the 1.2 billion that we sell, but it is up 6.8% so far this year. Okay, so what I would tell you is you will see not our specification shift, but you will see our marketing focus begin to drive that upper value that as, as we get more certified Angus beef prime in the market, you'll see us drive that more aggressively than what we even are today. Because our goal is not necessarily to, to restrict what comes in. We need every carcass we can get. But as long as we can create a premium like we've seen that flows back and continues to feed that signal, then we'll continue to take every head that we can at a level of specifications that the consumer has said that's a premium product. Other questions? Adalberto, back here. Well, thank you. Uh, this is going to be for uh, Dr. Spear, uh, or whoever can answer. Tonight, uh, something magic is going to happen, and our border to the south is going to be close to illegals, and drugs, that's a joke, okay? <laughs> that's not, that not gonna happen. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, tonight, they're gonna close to one million, 1.2 million of uh, feeders that they come across the border. Uh, but in that same magic night, they're going to close our market for all our cats that we send down south. Uh, what is going to happen with uh, all the grain that it takes to feed that cattle? What is going to happen when uh, 1.2 million is the yearly production of one of our major packing plants here in the southwest part of the state. So, what are you thinking about that? I, I want to make sure I understand your question that if we get these trade disruptions, you, you know, what are the implications? Is that, am I, am I interpreting, no pun intended, but am I getting that correctly? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, oh, that's, that's painful. Uh, right? Anytime you get any kind of trade disruption, you, you're going to have a major influence on the market, right? No matter what it is. And, and there's going to be winners and losers. The beauty of international trade is, I think, to John's point, it's free enterprise. Why, why would we want to restrict that? And one of the things that I always find very challenging about, for example, cattle coming out of Mexico, feeder cattle, right? I was just in uh, Santa Teresa, uh, I don't know, six, seven months ago, right? There, there are a lot of cattle that come in there. There are a lot of cattlemen in the United States, cattle feeders that benefit from that flow. That's a very important part of commerce and, and so my, my frustration is often I think we forget when we're trying to close our borders and there, there's lots of efforts, uh, you, you know, among some cattlemen groups that want to close our borders, no cattle out, no cattle in. Boy, that's, that, that's not going to be good for anybody, right? International trade, free markets are part and parcel of a free economy. And everybody wins. Well, not everybody wins, but everybody has more opportunity that way. Glenn, you might want to say something there. There we go. I agree entirely, but I was going to add a statistic to reinforce it. So if I put a picture of the globe in front of you, and you look at the Western Hemisphere, so North America and South America, that's currently home to about 15%, one five, 15% of the global population. 85% is not in the Western Hemisphere. So Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, and probably 12 people in Antarctica um, sums up to that, okay? So it's very important that we remain relations, I'm going even broader, outside of Western Hemisphere. It's very important closer to home as well. But the comment I just gave you gets even more stark if we look forward. So nobody today has mentioned Africa, and I'm gonna highlight that for a reason. There's some folks in this room that are the next generation for this discussion. And my forecast by the time I retire, and I played my hand earlier, I'm 42, so let's just say 25 years from now, is there will be more US beef exported to the continent of Africa than any of you in the room older than me ever thought. Now I wanna be very clear about something. I don't think the average resident in Africa is gonna be the target market for US beef. But I think the top three to maybe 10% income and wealth wise in a continent that's rapidly growing its population, some of which are gonna have notably higher buying power over that 25 years, is really important. So that's a 100% opportunity that's not being seized much today. It's the reason I give it to you. But the only way you seize that opportunity is to remain open on the global market. That's my add on. So what, one more point on the uh, import-export. So if we stopped, and help me here, Glenn, make sure that I get this right, but roughly 50, 60% of all the beef in the United States that we eat is consumed as hamburger, correct? And if we stop importing uh, and, and turning that into hamburger, then we have to use American cattle, grind chucks and rounds and things that are more expensive, and put those into hamburger. Expand on that point for me. Yeah. So the main point I would add is the largest role of meat imports is highly lean beef that we bring in to blend with less lean, specifically 50% trims. And we blend that for targeted use of an 80% or an 82% or you know, there's lots of different ground beef specs. If you're following me there, we add value to fed steers and heifers by increasing the value of 50% trim because we bring more highly lean in. To drive this point further, the work I've done on this topic is if you close the borders tomorrow and didn't bring in that beef, which is 100% hypothetical that I do not support, okay? I'm probably pretty clear with the audience on that. You would have a small boost in coal cow values in the US because the value of a coal cow goes up because its relative role as a source of lean went up overnight in that story but it's more than offset by the decline in fed animal value because 50% trim falls by more. Does so everybody follow me? So if, it, if you happen to be somebody that's gonna to retire tomorrow and you're gonna sell your whole cow-calf herd, that would help you. But it's only under certain weird examples where that's a net gain because the collective decline in the value of fed animals because of the decline of 50% trim is a bigger loss 
than a marginal gain on the value of coals. Thank you. Quick, Mark. How do you get more CA beef in schools? Tell us your name and where you're from, please. I'm Corbin Russell from Paxico, Northeast Kansas. And that is a great question. Uh, actually, how would we get more? I think some of it is awareness. You know, I think with uh, school boards and so forth, I, you, funny you bring that up. If you uh, follow uh, Joe Urban on social media, you got some thumbs up. Joe Urban is a, is a trained chef, okay? And he, uh, his, uh, he talks about uh, um, uh, making school food good again. And they, he is a, sc a school district in South Carolina that's 100% of their beef is certified Angus beef. And I think ultimately what it takes is it takes efforts on our part uh, in the beef community to continue to work with administrators and so forth on the value of great tasting food in school lunch programs and uh, continue to make sure that uh, they don't just nickel and dime this thing to death all the time, but rather understand what's best for the students, what encourages the students, what motivates the students to, to eat a school lunch. I think especially today when uh, uh, while it's not necessarily a question about nutrition, a question about taste and flavor and desire to eat school food when so many children, that's probably their one meal of the day that uh, they know is going to be uh, a full course meal in one form or another. So we got to continue to work hard to answer your question, but I, it's not as impossible as I think oftentimes we think uh, when we think about some of the financial restriction that school districts are under. Real quickly, I mentioned the glass is half full. We have it good. Part of the reason I'm optimistic is young men that are willing to ask questions, so keep it up. Thank you. Do you have another question, Mark? It's hard for me to see you right now. Yeah, I'm just carrying the microphone. Anybody have any questions? This is, this is great fun, thank you. When you look at your crystal ball, uh, all of you up there, um, you know, I love the, the comment, think globally, but act locally, okay? Be where your feet are. How do we start tomorrow one step at a time? How do we work to get better every day? I'll just throw it, starting with you, Greg. So first of all, Mark, I would tell you that I didn't come to this sale in the 80s or 90s, but this is, this crowd and this, the, the, work that your family has done to draw these people because of the genetics and the improvement that the whole Angus breed has made uh, and obviously the the, the improvements um, made by certifying Angus beef since I've been a reporter um, on this industry so I in my opinion in the the industry has a great future there may not be as many producers as there were 20 30 years ago and this obviously this drought is is devastating to a lot of people, but I am very optimistic about beef and the future of agriculture. Mark, I think it's a great question, and and um, whenever I do producer meetings, and we can we can talk about cattle, and we can talk about genomics and beef and production and all of that. To me, the difference is right here and here, and I always I generally end my presentations with a slide that that says, take charge of you. It's your attitude that makes a difference. And I always joke about, right, you know, when times are bad, people make each other crazy. In fact, they even depress each other. And I just actually wrote a column a couple of days ago, I think it ran, and I've probably gotten more feedback on that than anything, but it's, it's who you surround yourself with. In, in an event like this, you're, you're, you're surrounding yourself with positive people and, and where you're gonna go and you start to see the opportunities because there's so much <laughs> opportunity for negativity out there, right? The social media and, and those kinds of things. And so ultimately, right, I always joke and everybody kind of laughs, but they know it's true. I say, you know, stay out of the coffee shop, right? Because nothing good ever happens in a coffee shop. But ultimately, it's here and here and there's a good story and you gotta hang on to that because the future is, is it's very optimistic. Thank you. Um, I would like to add that Ukraine is a great example 
for everybody and good lesson to influence of influence of one single country on a all entire world and just think about how lucky you are that you have never had a real war on your land many farmers in ukraine lost their farms lost their land lost their animals some of them burned their field just for reasons that they didn't want Russians to get their grain. And that is hard, right, for farmer. So the issue is that now this war that we have, that is not only about Ukraine. This is about world structure. That is about world power, who will get the power. This is about total global food security. And this brings the lessons how interdependent all markets are, how interdependent all countries and all economies. So situation in Ukraine opened for you also new markets because we lost some markets, for example, in Indonesia or China or even in Africa. And somebody needs to replace this, how it's painful for me to say, but first of all, I'm an economist and uh, those people are starving and they need some food, right? So, and if Ukraine will be not able to return uh, to their top positions and to return to realize our export potential and our production potential, those countries will need some food, and I think that is a good point for America to open new markets. Thank you. Uh, just to add to that, um, I'm going to purposely repeat it. I'm optimistic if the beef cattle industry, for the most part, seizes the opportunity. I'm not naive to know we're all going to hug and get along and everything, is why I say for the most part. But if on balance, seizes the opportunity to leverage its comparative advantage. And I was, hopefully I was very clear with you guys earlier, grain finished beef is what I'm talking about there. I think the sky's the limit on global interest in that. But the part that's confusing is I'm not talking about the average resident in every country, right? You guys followed my example about Africa, but it's the same thing in lots of other countries. And frankly, it's the same thing in our own country, right? We're a country of over 300 million people and there's a lot of diversity in every way. You can think about it here as well. So the challenge is to get along as an industry a little bit more than we have the last three years, and to some extent 30 years, but particularly the last three is what's on my mind, to better seize that opportunity. I'm going to choose to be optimistic that collectively that economic carrot's big enough that this industry will do that, but there's got to be a little bit more improvement internally, and I don't mean just this room, I mean in the industry as a whole, and that's not necessarily with consumers and it's not with policymakers, I'm talking within the industry itself, to fully seize that opportunity. I'm optimistic we can do it, but there's work to be done. I agree with all that. And maybe the one thing I would add is that, you know, I'm gonna kind of focus on on something that's that is very real to us and that's marbling levels. I mean many of you are probably this room you know, if you're retaining ownership or you're getting data back on your calves, you've probably haven't seen, these are probably the highest percent choice, the highest CAB, the highest percent prime uh, percentages that you've seen on, on the progeny that you are producing in many cases. I would, I would challenge all of us as an Angus breed and as users of Angus genetics to not settle for where we at, to not think that we've arrived and to then take our eye off the ball. I would tell you that uh, of all the cattle out there that fail to certify into the brand, 82% of them still don't have enough marbling, okay? Now, 10 years ago, that number was about 95%. Five years ago, it was about 92%. So we've made huge swings. Part of it was the last drought that experienced, we liquidated all those cows and we repopulated with some of the highest quality Angus carcass-oriented cattle that are out there. And we made significant improvement. But I think we, we run the risk of maybe stepping back if we think we've arrived and don't continue to push the envelope for improvement on these things that we know are returning real dollars back to the bottom lines of our operations. Thank you so very much. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. 
Um, are y'all seeing an increase in market share uh, from small mom and pop butcher shops or producers who are able to produce beef and sell it directly to the consumer? One, are you seeing a, I would say, a significant market share increase? And two, uh, are there signs that it's going to continue to increase or is it starting to plateau? So I'll respond first and people are welcome to add to it. So there's definitely been an increase in both interest and the reality of that compared to say very early in 2020. So the pandemic magnified some of that interest. But for context, you know, this is a cattle herd of 30 million beef cows, not quite that now, right? But we're not talking even 5% of the beef volume that would fit what you just talked about. So. I'm a very much a free market capitalist, for anybody that's ever heard me hold the mic. I wish everybody in that example the best. That's one of the things I love about America is compared to a lot of other places, you have the opportunity to pursue that. So to each is their own and I wish them the best and there are success stories. But as the geeky academic economist, I also have to give us context and we're not feeding the US, much less the world beef with that model. I, I hope that response made sense. So it's grown, but it's growing from a very small base. One of the biggest challenges that those systems have ran into is this room, including myself, probably has a full deep freeze at home. I've got two teenage boys. We have two full deep freezes at home. This room understands that. But the typical American does not. And at the extreme, if you're in a small apartment in downtown New York City, you don't physically have space for one, right? I mean, it's you guys get the point. So some of those things face a real challenge on if you can't take half an animal, the marketing of it falls apart real fast. So there's a place for it and I wish them the best, but I don't see anytime soon that becoming much more than a small share is why I give you that add on. You know, one thing I might add to that is I think to go right along with that, I, I agree. I'm not sure it's going to be a, a market share grab, but what we do know and we've seen it amplified coming out of COVID, consumers want choices. They want, they want options, and we've, that's why we started Certified Angus Beef Natural clear back in 2002. It's, it's 4.7 million pounds out of 1.2 billion, okay? But, but folks want choices. They want options, and they want those to be quality-oriented. We're right now finishing up kind of a pilot phase of what we just started back in the fall called Ranch to Table, which is an option for Angus breeders to go consumer direct using the Certified Angus Beef logo. Okay, in one, a way to drive value back to those individual cattlemen that are using Angus genetics, that are registered Angus breeders, that are focused on delivering that product to the consumer or to a distributor or a restaurateur direct uh, as a means to leverage the brand that Angus producers own uh, in selling their own programs. The other part of it is, is while it may never replace the 100% of the inventory and purchases that some of our restaurateurs uh, uh, are doing today, they still want that option to tell a different story and to communicate differently with their consumers that still trust the certified Angus beef brand but have, have want different options about those supply channels. And so I, I agree. I think it's going to open up some opportunities for individuals that want to take that on. It's a lot of work. Uh, it probably isn't going to shift the market share any one way or the other. But for individual breeders, it might be uh, a significant change to their bottom line. One more question. Uh, it's great the higher quality we have and its value. My question would be, what kind of work can we do to work on portion control to where more people can really enjoy that eating experience? And, uh, and tie that with the fact that our cattle are bigger today, how, how might we change these cuts or, or develop new cuts to where, again, that helps with that portion control and the price back to the consumer? I'm going to answer this first is, uh, you know, I tell you, the, the end user world over the last, say, decade, when I started Certified Angus Beef uh, 24 years ago, the number one question is, we need these cattle smaller. We need them smaller. Uh, and uh, uh, honestly, I've not heard that in the last decade. In all honesty, here just last fall, we actually increased our carcass weight to 1,100 pounds from, from 1050. In 2006, it was 1,000 or less. Okay, and so what we've acknowledged is that for our brand to stay relevant, we've got to be able to understand what the economics are that are truly driving the industry and quality pounds pay more than fewer quality pounds, okay? 
so what we've been doing with, uh, from our standpoint, and, and it's the, the, the industry as a whole, I think, has been doing a nice job of this as well, is, is learning to use a, a really novel technology called a knife, okay, and make big pieces of meat into smaller pieces of meat. And I would tell you, that works extremely well for every cut except one. Anybody have an idea what it is? The ribeye, okay? Okay, the ribeye is the struggle, and it's the one that we run into probably as much issue with uh, portion sizing, Sam, to your point. We've seen uh, a growing market for big strip loins split right down the middle, the long way, to make strip loin logs and then carving stations or make, cut them into to strip loin medallions or, or strip loin fillets. We see more and more of that all the time, and I think we're doing a good job by being able to support the economics of cattle production, making them bigger and so forth. Uh, but if we could find a way to manage that, that rib differently, then we'd be a lot farther along the road, uh, I think, in being able to say we've got a solution. But, but the knife has been the best technology, muscle separation, um, you know, and so forth, just fabbing these carcasses different. And this is where our food service distributors, our packer partners, and so forth, have really done a nice job, I think, collectively helping our industry maintain the driving economics of, of carcass weight while still trying to make sure we aren't giving up too much in terms of how these portion sizes increase demand. But it's real. You walk into the store and you've got a, an 1899 ribeye per pound sitting there and that thing is uh, you know a pound and a half. Um, a lot of folks are going to walk away from that one. As a quick add-on if I may, the industry there's a massive opportunity to accomplish that and there's gonna be a lot of money lost if the industry doesn't figure that out in the next 10 years and the reason I say that is I, I lead a project called the Meat Demand Monitor. It's a very dense survey project that I won't bore you with unless you want me to. But one of the things that we've identified in the last, and it's beef and pork check off funded, so that's why I'm bringing it up, everything's fully transparent on it. But the Gen Z and millennial generations, so those younger than me, for reference here, have an average of four and a half eating events a day. If you're a baby boomer, it's almost exactly three. Why am I telling you that? The younger you are, A, you're more likely to be worried about exercise and physical fitness and so forth. I'm not picking on our elders, but just listen to me for a moment. There's that pattern in our society. But if you're going to eat more than three times a day, you're less willing to sit and have a 12-ounce steak in one of them. But the opportunity is, can you get higher price per ounce, four-ounce steaks in front of them twice a day? There may be boomers that will never buy the four-ouncer because it doesn't look right. But if there's a 35-year-old that'll pay twice as much per ounce, why wouldn't you sell it to them? Any other thoughts or questions? Well, this has been tremendous. It's very exciting. Obviously, it's an all-star cast. We thank you so much for your time. You know, we, we have these events, and, and we think, oh, man, this is so, so cool. It reminds me of... You know, you talked about Larry Cora. We call him Uncle Larry Cora around here. And if you want to read about him out on the wall. And we've got a celebrity, Dr. Dave Nichols. Uh, he's a podcaster and a teacher and an innovator. Uh, but this is fun. You know, the reason I didn't want to be on here is so I could listen and learn. And so one time Henry told Larry Cora in 1998, he said, you know, Pretty soon, we're going to have prime that far exceeds the amount of certified Angus beef we have today. And that's opportunity. And that opportunity has come true. So I say thank you so very much. I say as beef producers, you ain't seen nothing yet. We've only just begun. So one last housekeeping. We need to, to get better what we do. Callahan Grum, U.S. Cattle Trace, would you stand up? Uh, we need a traceback system in the United States of America. There's two countries in the world that don't have it, us and India. So we can do this, as Henry would say, so let's get to doing it. Thank you all so very much.